so good evening once again uh, welcome back to the penultimate <clears throat> class on the question paper analysis of ugc net english december 2021 shift 1 presented by uh, professor academy chennai and we are going to discuss questions from 91 to 95 today question number 91 match list 1 we have the first line of a po poems or uh, first lines of poems with uh, list 2 we have poets so capital a this is a line courage he said and pointed to the land against which we have gm hopkins then b i am poor brother lipo by your leave against which we have tennison then c i caught this morning morning's uh, morning's minion against which we have three dg rosetti d look on my face my name is might have been against which we have four arnold then e the sea is calm tonight against which we have five browning so what we have to do we have to just eliminate options you know at least you can recognize one or two this is a bit easy you know uh the sea is calm tonight that's a famous poem uh from dover beach you can identify then e you can um, you just e go for it so if you crack it then that's actually the answer right sometimes questions like this if you know one or two you can easily crack the entire option you need not go through the entire one the c is calm tonight and we know c is calm tonight e then we go for a matthew arnold then then that's a bit we eliminate two options then we are stuck with uh, uh, two but let's see one by one how we we can go for it first one courage he said and pointed toward the land so this is the opening line of alfred tennyson's the lotus eaters and the speaker is ulysses ulysses with his sailors are on the way to ithaca right they are on the sea but uh, he is asking them yes we have been on the sea you know uh, now pluck up your courage definitely we will reach ithaca so he is encouraging his sailors but this mounting wave will roll us uh, shoreward soon so he is giving them hope in the afternoon they came up came unto a land in which it seemed always afternoon now we have ulysses and his sailors reaching a land where we have the lotus eaters and they present them you know present these people with the fruits of uh, lotus and once you eat that you know you think you are lost and you don't want to leave that land forever so that's how they are caught in that land where uh, lotus eaters live then second this line i am poor brother lipo by your leave this is the first line of uh, robert browning's dramatic monologue fra lipo lippi fra fra lipo lippi a monk as well as a painter now this monk is caught by a night watchman a uh, night watchman or watchman and now he has to give some explanation why he is he is out at this time of night he is among he is supposed to be at the monastery but what is he doing at night especially at this hour but uh, fra lipo lippi where from means brother a uh, priest but this priest has some connection with the higher people and uh, he doesn't bother about being caught by these uh, gods so he gives a long lecture and and he talks about his painting and art in general so i am poor brother lipo by your leave you need not clap your torches to my face so don't bother you know to show your you know burning torches to identify my face zooks what is to blame uh, you think uh, you see a monk yes he is a monk and he justifies and he is actually uh, <clears throat> indulging in uh, secret pleasure uh, at night now he is caught and he is defending himself and he has to escape from the gods then we have this line i caught this morning morning uh, morning's minion kingdom of daylight's dolphin tapple dapple drawn drawn sorry dawn drawn falcon uh, this line is from gm hopkins the windover to christ our lord that's the subtitle of this poem so in this poem uh, we have a speaker 
who is wavering in his decision. Whereas uh, he looks at a falcon in the sky, which is not wavering, uh, which is very dominant and it, it is not wavering. It has the power to float uh, in the sky, in the air without any effort. So it is determinant. Whereas uh, in contrast, we have the speaker uh, who is wavering in his decision, whether to be a priest or not, or to perceive art or not. So that is the position. So this contrast is shown uh, through the determination or the easy floating of the falcon. Next, we have this line, look in my face. My name is might have been. I'm also called no more, too late, farewell. Unto thine ear I hold the dead she shell. Cast up thy life's foam fretted feet between. So this is a line, the first line uh, from a sonnet in DJ Rossetti's famous sonnet sequence, The House of Life. So it's a sonnet sequence. And this line is from one of the sonnets. But we need not bother about this because when we get max of following, at least if you are able to crack one or two, for all Ipolipi is an easy to find by Browning. And Dover Beach is also easy to find. Matthew Arnold. So the first line, the sea is calm tonight is from Matthew Arnold's Dover Beach. So here is a speaker who is speaking to his uh, lady love or wife. And it talks about uh, the world in general. And they are um, in a house near uh, Dover Beach and they are looking at the French coast. The tide is full, the moon lies fair upon the straits on the French coast, the light gleams and is gone. The cliffs of England stand glimmering and vast out in the tranquil bay. So then he invites his um, lady love to the window to look at the world outside. Come to the window, sweet is the night air. Then let's go to uh, question number 92. So this time again, a match, match the following. List one, writer. List two, book. So we have Bakim Chandra Chatterjee against which we have the novel, Untouchable. Then we have B, Mulkura Janan against which we have uh, Raj Mohan's uh, wife. That's the name of a novel. Then we have C, uh, Panch Kauri Khan against which we have three stories from Indian Christian life. Uh, then D, Kamala um, Satyanathan, against which we have four, the revelations of an orderly. It's a bit tough, but one novel is very easy to find. We have Mulkraj Anand, Untouchable, that's a classic. So B, we can go for one. So we can eliminate two options. So of the four options, uh, we have B and D, where we have option B, Mulkraj Anand, associated with uh, untouchable. Then we can also uh, find another parallel. D, Kamala uh, Satyanathan associated with uh, uh, <clears throat> stories from Indian Christian life. Right. So now only one decision to make. Whether A, Bakim Chandra Chatterjee wrote uh, Raj Mohan's wife or revelations of an orderly. So that is a question. And if you know that maybe you, you go with instinct, he could have written what? Bakim Chandra Chatterjee, Raj Mohan's wife or the revelations of an orderly? Answer is B, option B, A, Bakim Chandra Chatterjee, Raj Mohan's wife. B, Mulkraj Anand, we have untouchable. C, uh, Paunch Kauri Khan, we have the revelations of an orderly. D, Kamala Satyanathan, we have stories from Indian Christian life. So this question this time is not from contemporary Indian uh, novels, but from Anglo-Indian novels. So what we have to do, so we have to pay some attention to uh, early Indian novels. So the question is from that period. So let's see Mulkraj Anand. When we see Mulkraj Anand, yes, we think of Untouchable. We also think of his another famous work, Cooley. Then these are some of his famous works, Two Leaves and a Bud. And this is a trilogy. I mean, this trilogy consists of the village, across the black waters, the sword and the sickle. Who knows, next time they may ask you know, about this trilogy. Then uh, the private life of an Indian prince. Okay. Then let's go to Bakim Chandra Chatterjee. He wrote in Bengali, but the first novel he wrote was actually in English. So that's the question we got. Uh, Raj Morgan's 
uh, wife but he wrote in bengali these are some of his bengali novels we have dar gash nandini 1865 then we have anantamath this is important why in this novel in this bengali novel we have this song vande mataram uh, which we sing right so this could be a question vande mataram the song appears in which novel by bakim chandra chatterjee that could be a, a question in the next net exams then we have this work uh, panch kauri khan's uh, uh, the revelations of an orderly published in uh, 1846 for the first time then this is a subtitle of this work being an attempt to expose the abuses of administration because it uh, uh, it was written during the uh, british government uh, british um, colonial period so by the uh, <clears throat> administration by the relation of everyday occurrences in the mafsal courts then we get uh, kamala satyanathan known for her short story collection uh sh- stories of indian christian life published in 1898 uh she published it with along her uh, husband who also contributed a few st- uh, stories to this collection samuel so kamala satyanathan and uh, she is uh, especially noted for this work i mean magazine the indian ladies magazine she edited this work uh, and it was uh, started in the year 1901 then let's go to question number 93 which of these does meenakshi mukherjee propose as the possible target readership of early indian english novel so this question is connected with the earlier question because both deal with early indian english novel so this time from meenakshi mukherjee's approach uh, work so we have four options here i mean four statements a a pan indian readership so do you think the target of uh, early indian english is a pan indian pan indian means all across india do you think so or b a localized indian readership c a british readership so in the, these works uh, in a targeted british readership and d the colonial administrator in india so at least you can eliminate so do you think a it's too early to think a pan indian readership do you think early 1800s or 1850s and 1900s do you think uh, indian english novel targeted uh, you know readers across india so that seems impossible right so at least if you make a make such a decision then you can eliminate option b and c right then we are stuck with two option a c and d only i mean a uh, british readership and the colonial administrator in india so that could be one option or you can go for b and c a localized indian readership and a british readership so let's go answer is given so the given answer is actually c and d a british readership and the colonial administrator in india so this question is taken from meenakshi mukherjee's uh, work the twice born fiction themes and techniques of the indian novel in english so this is a very famous work and if you want to do some research on the indian novel in english this is an essential book and this is the only statement uh, that is connected to the earlier question the earlier question is not directly taken from here maybe that is based on the understanding of the question setter so this is the statement you know the the closest statement to the earlier question from this uh, work indo anglican literature may have begun as a colonial venture so this is a only reference to that vaguely aspiring to continue the great english tradition so when indians started writing in english especially novels or poetry earlier um, they followed the tradition the english tradition or english way of writing novels their setting characterization then after a period of time they addressed the local issues and national consciousness came in okay so uh, minach mukherjee says the indian anglican novel made a diffident appearance you know not confident uh, in the 1920s then gradually gathered confidence and established itself in the next 
two centuries. So 1930s and 40s. So this work, I mean, uh, Meenakshi Mukherjee's The Twice Born Fiction focused on that period. I mean, from 1930s to 1964, uh, some 30, 34 years. So Meenakshi Mukherjee says in this work, I'm going to analyze select novels published between these two years. I mean, between this period, 1930 and 1964. And she says, uh, the Indo-Anglican fiction you know, uh, history can be divided into three stages, large stages. Number one, the first period of the Indo-Anglican uh, fiction, we have historical romance, generally set in a historical period, but it's something with uh, adventures. Then two, we gain national consciousness about Indian independence, then social issues. So social or political realism. So that is uh, stage two. Then comes third stage, psychological novels. So this, these novels focus on um, a particular character and that character's uh, perception of the world. So that is a later development, okay? So these are the three uh, large stages uh, mentioned by Menakchi Mukherjee. So what we have to do whenever we read or whenever we analyze an old question paper, so take one more step, learn one more point about the given option, okay? So with this, let's go to uh, question number 94. Given below are two statements. So we have assertion A, then reason. So that is a statement, then followed by an explanation. Let's see, assertion. Postmodern narratives focus on the indeterminate and unstable nature of textuality and subjectivity. So whenever we look at postmodern narratives, 1950s, after 1950s, uh, they they are slippery, right? Postmodern fiction, they don't talk about a uh, stable thing. So that seems good. Then reason. So do you think this is a reason? Postmodern narrative acts regard narratives and characters as tentative representations of writing and identity. So look at the word, they're a kind of indeterminate, unstable, and here tentative, not fixed. So could be, so you can eliminate certain things. So if you think A is true, then let's um, eliminate um, at least two, right? Uh, option A, A is false, but R is true. We can eliminate that. Uh, we can keep B. And let's go for C and D. Both A and R are true, and R is the correct explanation of A. Or both A and R are true, but R is not the correct explanation of a. So it should be either C or D, right? Then let's go. Answer is C. Both assertion and reason are true and reason is the correct explanation of A. How do we know that? So if you want to know more about postmodern or postmodern literature, please read uh, this writer, Ehab Hazen, and his views on postmodernism. So he comes up with uh, a kind of a classification, a kind of a tabular column, on the one side, uh, we have modernism. On the other side, postmodernism. This is not the entire list given by E. Hop Hawes. And I'm just giving you the relevant points for to explain this question. So whenever we think about modernism after 1900s, we think of Virginia Woolf, James Joyce, Dorothy Richardson, and D.H. Lawrence, and Henry James. The form is actually conjunctive and closed, right? Kind of a typical form. Postmodernism, there is no form at all. Anti-form, fragmentation. Think of um, uh, you know, modern fictions, you know, after James Joyce Ulysses. There is a kind of an anti-form, it's a kind of a fragmentation, disjunctive and open ending. That is not closed. At least in modernism, yes, modernism, yes, we have fragmentation, but there's a kind of a sense of an ending you can see in modernism. But postmodernism doesn't offer a sense of an ending to a work or a novel. Then there is a kind of a purpose we see in modernism, but here is only play. I mean, random, random act. It's not a purposeful design. And here we see a structure in a work, but here it is left to choice, right? Uh, think of, for instance, uh, Italo Calvino's If on a Winter's Night, a Traveler, a novel which is left to chance. It goes on and on. Then here it's a kind of a hierarchy, modernism, but here anarchy. Then here you need the presence, here absence. 
And the final point is important because that is relevant to the question directly. Here, determinancy, something that is stable. Here, indeterminancy, that's not stable, okay? So you can check out the other points given by Ehab Hausen on postmodernism. Then let's uh, discuss the last question of today's class, 95. Who among these does Gabriel Garcia Marquez, the Colombian novelist known for his magic realism, name right in the beginning of his Nobel Prize address? So we have four, uh, capital A, Ferdinand Magellan, B, Christopher Columbus, C, Marco Polo, D, Antonio Bigafita, right? So now this, this question is a bit tough. It's tough, uh, not a bit tough, it's a tough question. Generally, we expect questions based on Gabriel uh, Garcia Marquez novels or his uh, short stories or magic realism in general or Latin America. But this time they have asked question from his uh, Nobel Prize address, a kind of a lecture. He gave uh, a lecture. So we have to guess, then we will discuss uh, the speech. So go for an option. So he could have mentioned uh, Magellan or Polo. Oh, no, we have this explorers. Definitely one explorer. Which explorer is the key, right? Let's go to the answer. Answer is A. Ferdinand Magellan and we have Antonio Bigafita. So this, uh, this is the answer. But let's look at uh, this uh, lecture. It's titled, uh, it's a translation. He spoke in Spanish. Uh, title, The Solitude of Latin America. So we have Gabriel Garcia Marcus, who was awarded the Nobel Prize in the year 1982. And December 8, he gave this lecture. So this is the opening line. Then we can also see whenever there is a tough question, the tough question is not actually an in-depth question. It's only a surface level question. They ask from the opening line or kind of a surface one. It's not an in-depth one. So let's see. Antonio Bigafita, a Florentine navigator who went with Magellan on the first voyage around the world. From the opening line, they have asked this question. Wrote, so Antonio Bigafita wrote, upon his passage through our southern lands. So talking about Latin America, that is South America. So North America, we have Canada, then America. So below we have South America, including which has uh, Brazil, Peru, Chile, then we have uh, Colombia, there are a lot of other countries, right? So Southern Lands of America, a strictly accurate account that nonetheless seem, uh, resembles a venture into fantasy. So Marcus is talking about the established history about Latin America, but misrepresentation. How Latin America has been misrepresented by explorers. So that has to be corrected. Next. Uh, it's uh, around two or three pages uh, lecture. Um, uh, let's also look at some of the uh, famous people uh, mentioned by Gabriel Garcia Marquez in his lecture. 11 years ago, I mean 1971, the Chilean Pablo Neruda. So Pablo Neruda, uh, when we read Latin American literature, he is considered one of the uh, iconic figures in uh, Latin American literature from Chile. So he's considered the national poet of Chile. So one of the outstanding poets of our time enlightened this audience with his word. So in 1971, he was awarded the Nobel Prize. So now Gabriel Garcia Marquez is talking about the history of Latin America as well as Latin American literature and uh, Nobel laureates who earlier won uh, uh, awards. Then he ends his speech with uh, William Faulkner. On a day like today, my master, even this could be a question. Uh, whom does uh, Gabriel Garcia Marcus regard as his master? So he addresses William Faulkner, the American writer known for his stream of conscious technique and uh, you know inner reality, representing inner reality of characters. So he calls uh, Gabriel Garcia uh, Marcus calls William Faulkner his master. My master William Faulkner said, "I decline to accept the end of man." So we always fight. So human beings, we don't give up, we always fight. So that is the spirit we need. So he ends his speech with a positivity. Uh, and even uh, William Faulkner, he was awarded the Nobel Prize uh, 32 years ago. I mean, uh, when Gabriel Garcia got, Marcus got his Nobel Prize. 
So uh, William Faulkner was awarded the Nobel Prize in 1949. So with this, he ended his speech. And with this, uh, let's also finish this class. So what we can do now? So his, his speech, I mean, William Faulkner's speech, Nobel Prize speech is also a famous speech. So what we can do, maybe we can uh, look at few speeches, famous speeches. Maybe we can look at William Faulkner's speech. Or if there is a mention of, uh, you know, uh, Swedish Academy's mention of uh, or description of these writers. So we can think of uh, uh, other Nobel laureates or Tahur or AIDS or we have uh, uh, Bernard Shaw. So we can read about these uh, writers and the Nobel Prize speech or uh, Swedish Ac Academy's description of their contribution to literature. Okay. So with this, let's end uh, today's uh, class. Thank you so much. Please subscribe to this channel for further notification and you can also